Linda and welcome back to my channel. Today we will do a brief analysis on the show Euphoria, the US version that is, and how it portrays trauma. If you are new to this channel, then welcome. Here we talk about how to apply spiritual and personal development concepts to help you live a more meaningful and fulfilling life. And if you find this content helpful, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. So I want to start with a disclaimer. I have not watched Euphoria in its entirety. I am not in the US right now, and it is a little bit harder for me to get access to all of the content. Now, I am, however, fully caught up on what's been happening in the show from the clips that I've seen on YouTube and the reactions that I've seen to the show. But it's very likely that I may have missed some of the backstory on some of the characters. So I wanted to be clear that my analysis here is based on what I've seen and is only meant to serve as a way to help you understand some aspects of the trauma. That is, I'm not going to be reviewing or reacting to the show. It's talking about the show with the intent of helping you use some of the situations portrayed as a learning tool. Now, I chose to do just one video for the entire show so far. If you want me to do an analysis video for each of the episodes, please let me know that in the comments. So the first thing I will say is that this show is riddled with trauma and a lot of the behaviors that we see in it may appear extreme, but are behaviors that are commonly seen in teenagers and actually also in many, many adults. One example from the show that really stood out to me was on episode one of season two two yeah of season two episode one cassie is talking to mckay and she says to him i don't know if i am a good person i'm sorry what's wrong i shouldn't be anybody's girlfriend what does that mean And that actually really stuck with me because it is a very common for traumatized people to act out their pain, their rage, their fear, and also sometimes their sense of powerlessness by behaving in ways that are not only hurtful and possibly harmful to others, but that are also sabotaging their own opportunities for success, for love, for happiness, for growth. Now this uh, comment is actually something that I've also heard Rue say several times, including the time she said it to her father in that hallucination that she had. I think it was episode four of season two. And I think also she said something similar or to that effect to Ali in the special episode that was in between seasons. And I think this really stuck out to me because just because you do bad things, that does not mean that you are a bad person. Good people do really bad things just as often as bad people can do good things. You are not what you do. But when you have traumatic experiences as a child, a lot of us end up internalizing the experiences as there being something wrong with us. This can happen because a child has limited capacity for cognition, right? So a child has a limited capacity to really understand things in context. And they need to find a way to justify the pain, the abuse, the neglect, whatever it is that is being inflicted upon them. So from the perspective of the mind of a child, there cannot be something wrong with my parents or my, my caretakers 
because they are the ones that are supposed to take care of me, protect me, love me above all else and ensure my survival. And if they are incapable of doing that, that means I as a child will not survive, which is really a terrifying proposition. So in the subconscious mind of a child, it seems safer to create the belief that there is something wrong with us instead of them. That is with the child instead of the parents or the caretakers. Now, as we grow older, those beliefs are oftentimes confirmed through our parents or our caretakers projections up on us, like saying that we are bad or that we're not good enough or ignoring us, neglecting us, etc., which can actually give rise to related beliefs like that we are unworthy, for example, which is a very, very common pattern that I see in my practice. So that desire to have our needs met is what is at the root, but all the beliefs that we are unworthy, undeserving, or that we are bad are constantly coming up to derail our attempts to fulfill that need. What I mean is that we are wanting to have that love. We are wanting to have that safety. We are wanting to have that connection, that protection, right? That affection, that approval. But because we don't, right? Those beliefs are created to justify those circumstances and they get reinforced throughout our lives. So for example, Cassie having a connection with someone like McKay who cares for her and respects her, but ending it with him because she hooked up with Nate, right? And granted, McKay made some unkind comments, and but, but in general, generally he seemed to care about her. What can happen for a real life Cassie is that they feel that if the person ever saw who they really are, right? This They have this belief that they are unworthy. And if this person that I love or that I'm connected to ever really saw who I was, who the unworthy person, right? That child that was told that they were bad or that they're not good enough or that wasn't loved or that wasn't protected, right? If they ever saw that aspect of me, they would leave me or not love me anymore, Right? Because you have to remember that that person, Cassie in this case, and a lot of us believe that we are bad and unworthy. I hope that's clear. Also, in this case, another layer may come into play, right? With McKay being in college, Cassie's sense of abandonment was probably triggered as well. And as she feels the loss of connection, she may have gone to look for it somewhere else, Nate in this case, which also happens to be a popular star athlete, which could also help her feel validated and worthy. So as you can see, it sounds super convoluted, but this these types of situations and dynamics are very, very nuanced and is almost like a vicious cycle. You know, different beliefs start looping and feeding each other and oftentimes branch out. Now, I want to stop here for a moment to address the use of the word trauma because I know that some people feel that the word has lost its meaning and that is applied all over the place nowadays. But if you ask me, I think it just was not used enough in the past because most of us have some level of trauma. In fact, one of my mentors describes trauma as distress without resolution. And actually another one of my mentors describes it as what happens inside you as a result of what happened to you. So these are very catchy and they're both very clear-cut definitions of trauma, I will give you a bit of a lengthier description, and this is not exactly a definition, but it's how I describe trauma 
to the clients that I work with. And I describe it as an unresolved, painful and or scary experience that because it cannot be fully expressed or processed at the time, drives us to disconnect from ourselves as a way to adapt, as a way to cope and survive, but continues to impact us from our subconscious, our subconscious mind well into adulthood. Now, if you are one of those people who do not like the word used all the time, the word trauma, that is, then another word that I use often is the word wound. And I find that it can be a very appropriate replacement. So you're welcome to borrow it if you'd like. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Another very interesting aspect of the show is their portrayal of intense emotion, especially in those very turbulent teenage years, and not just their portrayal, but how they portray it and how each character handles them. Now, I'm not an addiction expert, but from the people that I know that are recovering addicts, what I have observed is that their pain was so intense that they would have done just about anything to distract from it or to numb it down altogether. And I mean, in I think it's episode five of the second season, you literally see Rue running through the streets to run away from her family and friends to avoid going to rehab. I mean, if that's not a metaphor for running away from pain, I don't know what is. Now, in Rue's case, her choice tends to be to numb the pain, but other people oftentimes choose distraction, which can come about through sex or any type of addictive tendencies, etc., or even sometimes through the experience of physical pain as a way to sort of redirect the energy and find some level of relief and or release, which actually makes me think about when Nate woke up in the hospital after getting beat up. He woke up with a smile on his face. Now, this can be interpreted in many different ways, but to me, what it felt like is that all of the emotional and psychological pain he had experienced finally found an outlet through the physical pain he was in. And this is actually one of the reasons why people sometimes practice self-harm, right? It actually gives all of that bottled up pain that has been, in Nate's case, seeping through and leaking for a very long time. It actually gives them an outlet or gives it the pain that is an outlet. But what we see with Rue is this really strong desire to numb. Just like in real life, you can see that for Rue, this ends up being actually a double-edged sword because you don't get to choose which emotions to numb and which ones to keep active. For example, in the case of Rue, she states that when she was having sex with Jules, that she could not even feel any sexual pleasure because she was high and numb, right? And that is oftentimes what happens when we choose to numb our emotions. And sometimes we choose to do that consciously, and sometimes we choose to do the we choose to do that subconsciously. Sometimes we do it with substances like drugs or addictions, but there's other ways that you could also numb that pain. The thing about it is, it's that is an all or nothing game. It's sort of like a pendulum, right? The swing to the right is in direct correlation with the swing to the left. 
So the farther the bob travels to the left, the farther it will travel to the right. So I don't know if that analogy actually helped much, but what I'm trying to say is if you numb down the pain, you are also numbing down your capacity to feel joy. And I'm going to, I pause there because I want that to sink in. If you numb down the pain, you are also numbing down your capacity to feel joy and to feel just about any other emotion. Again, is an all or nothing game. And just because you numb them down or don't feel them does not mean that those emotions are not still there in your subconscious right under the surface. Okay. So for me personally, I was only able to experience joy when I stopped resisting feeling the deep pain that I was carrying. It was almost like allowing that painful emotion to, or those painful emotions, I should say, to express themselves made room in my soul and my system for the joy to come in. And I find that that particular subject seems to be an undertone of the entire series, really emotions and how to navigate them or, well, more accurately in the case of the show, how not to navigate them, right? So how is this helpful to your day-to-day life? Well, learning to feel express and navigate our emotions is really an essential part of growth and an essential part of our well-being. It is actually something that has shifted considerably over the last decade because most of us were never taught or even encouraged for that matter, right, to identify and express our genuine emotions, let alone taught how to navigate them, much less in relation to other people, right? And this is why the advent of emotional intelligence, I believe, has become so popular in the last decade or so, because after generations of suppressing and repressing emotions, we are finally coming to the realization that emotions are actually a very important and distinctive part of being human and actually emotions can provide us with a lot of information about our wants about our needs about our desires about who we are as beings in this world and exploring our emotions and understanding our trauma can bring us a lot of clarity about our own motivations. Now, this will not only improve our relationships and also our, even our demeanor, but it will also help us make conscious choices that align with the life that we want to create for ourselves, right? So it is really important that we learn these skills so that we can actually thrive in our lives. So having said all that, how about you guys? Did you identify with anything I talked about or even anything in the dynamics of the show? And no shame in that, right? I actually identify with a lot of the dynamics of the show. And actually, there are some episodes that I haven't been able to see a lot of because they can be really triggering. So I need to process. I need to be in a, you know the right state of mind, etc. So... I, I am very curious if any of you relate to anything that I've said or to any of the dynamics that you've seen in the show. And I'm also very curious if you find the show helpful or if you actually find it triggering or both. I mean, in my case, it's both. I actually find it very helpful and I also find it, it can be very triggering, in particular the last episode that I saw, which I think it was episode number five. Yeah, is when they were trying to get Ruth through to rehab, etc. I found that episode super, super 
triggering and it gave me a lot of anxiety actually watching it which actually speaks to how great they are as actors but also because I could relate to some of the things that I was seeing on screen right so I would love to hear your opinions about the subject and please just write them in the comments and I hope you found this content helpful thank you so much for watching this is Linda Feliciano and until next time namaste Thank you.